Well, I was torn, actually. Uh, should I do something on prophecy? Or should I do something else? And usually when I, I, I'm invited, which is very gracious of pastor to invite me, and that's what you get for being a close friend. So, but uh, I thought we'd do something a little different tonight. Because as Pastor mentioned, one day soon, I think sooner rather than later, we're going to meet God face to face in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So if I were, you're, you're going to get some handout sheets uh, uh, that might help us, but without looking at the sheets, so no cheating. Right? No cheating. This is not an open book test. If somebody were to ask you, what is God like? Or would you please define what we mean by the word God? What is a definition for God? I'm not asking for his attributes or his traits. I'm asking how do you define, what is it that defines God? What is God? Right? So you think about it for just a minute. You think about it. If somebody on the street were to ask you, what do you mean by God? How would you answer that? You're going to find out that that's not as easy to do as you think it is. Well, my God has a son and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is a trinity. Pastor just mentioned to me tonight, unbeknownst to me, I really didn't know this. Pastor is dealing or was dealing this morning with the trinity. So this will, I think this will dovetail right into his message. So I, I think that's wonderful. That's providential. But we say, in God we trust. Right? Or, God bless America. Matter of fact, my, my opinion is, that it should never be God bless America. It should always be America bless God. I, that's just, I'm opinionated sometimes, you know what I mean. There are two problems when we use the word God. The first problem is, which God are we speaking about? You see how easy it is to use the word God? Let me, let me explain what I mean. I can talk about God all day long. I'm still allowed to do this in this country. For how long, I don't know. But as long as I say God, nobody's going to be too offended. Let me change that. Jesus. Now somebody's going to be offended. Right? Now I've defined myself a little more. So which God are we uh, uh, referring to? to? To which God do we have uh, a reference that's the first question. Second question, what do we mean by the word God? And here's where we're looking for definition. And on your sheets, now you're allowed to look at your sheets. On your sheets, I would like to uh, deal with how we describe God, how he is described and how he is denied. Okay? I'm not going to go through all of these tonight. Because you'd have to strap on your seat belts, you'd have to have extra coffee, orange juice, the windows open, and it'll be an all-nighter. And I'm not, I'm not prepared for that, you know. I might fall asleep just standing up doing this kind of thing. And we wouldn't want that to happen, I don't think. But at least let me give you a bird's eye view of what we mean by the word God. Are you ready? You ready? So here he is described. And if you'll turn in Isaiah to Isaiah, the prophet, uh, chapter 44, we will begin. And this is sort of like a, a chronological type thing that we're doing tonight. We're going to go through the scriptures beginning with the earlier passages uh, in, in the Bible towards the latter passages for, for both of these sections. But when we 
talk about the word God, first of all, we, we are speaking about someone who has no rival. Now, in the back of your minds and in the back of my mind, I immediately am thinking about the God of the Bible. Okay? Somebody else may be thinking about another subject. In my mind, there is only one God, and he's the God of the Bible. And there is no other. So let's look at Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 44, and verse 8. This is a great verse. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Ah, that's a great job description for believers. You are my witnesses. God today does not use angelic hosts to witness. He uses you as human instruments to witness of his grace. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. Now listen carefully. I know not one. The God of the Bible says, I don't know of any other God. There's only me. And that's it. You shall have no other God besides me. As a matter of fact, if you'll turn your page to the second sheet, I, I won't belabor that, but I wanted you to see how Isaiah deals with the uniqueness, the onlyness, if there's such a word, of God. And what Isaiah is saying is what so many others have said in the scriptures throughout the Bible, there is no other God. So when we are going to define the concept of God or Godness, we must begin with the fact that he has no rival. I would like to invite you uh, to 1 uh, Corinthians, uh, if you, you don't mind, uh, chapter 8. And this is an important passage. And I don't think that we have often reflected on this particular portion of Scripture. It goes well with other Scriptures that tell us that Jesus is the only way. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if you would be so kind. Beginning with verse 5, and then we'll look at verse 6. Very important passage of the Bible. For even if there are so-called gods, small g, so-called, people call them that, okay? Even if there are such, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, absolutely there are many. Matter of fact, the Hindus have approximately 300 million gods with a small g. So there are many gods out there, right? Yes, there are, small g. Yet, verse 6, for us there is only one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. There's only one, and his name is God, the biblical God, the God of the Bible. So he has no rival. He has no competition. There's nobody else out there in this entire universe, nor ever has been, nor ever will be. He is solely the only true God of this universe. That's part of the definition. The second part is, he is a supreme being. When we speak about God or Godness, we are saying that he is supreme. He is on top of this universe. He owns not only the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50, but he owns all the gold. He owns this universe. He made it for his own glory. He is supreme. Look at Daniel chapter 4. Now this is an interesting passage. If you, if you will be so kind to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. And look closely at verses 34 to 37. Now, this is a pagan king saying this. Uh, there is some debate as to whether Nebuchadnezzar, I call him Nebu, it's easier to say Nebu than Nebuchadnezzar. You almost have to know a Middle East language or something to say those words. 
So let's call him Nebu. There's some debate as to whether Nebu was saved or not. Uh, I hope that he was. I, I mean, it would be wonderful if that were the case. Notice carefully in verses 34 through 37, the supremacy of God. He's supreme. And at the end of the time, I, Nebu, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lived forever. By the way, this is one king who for seven years enjoyed eating grass. He did. He was out there like a cow chomping on the grass. God taught him a lesson, I think. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Now remember, in those days when we are reading this, Babylon, of which he was the king, was the kingdom on earth. And he was the ruler, the top of this kingdom. And here is the number one man in the world. Do you know who the number one in the world is today? Number one? Ah, oh, no you don't. Not Mr. Obama. He has just been replaced, he's number two now, by Mr. Putin of Russia. That's right. Right. Well, this is like Mr. Putin over here. And he's been eating grass for about seven years. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Like a drop in the bucket. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. Guess what? He does just what he wants to do. That's supremacy. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is human's business to say to God, you're not doing it right? Tell me another one. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me, my counselors and nobles restored to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excel excellent majesty was added to me. Folks, what do you do when the king's out chomping on the grass for seven years? How do you make excuses for him? How does uh, the New York Times carry this article? Well, this would be the Babylonian Times, I think. Right? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He is not the king of earth. God is the king of heaven. All of whose works are truth, his ways justice, those who walk in pride, he's able to put down, as Nebu found out, right? If I were to describe God, the word God, I would first of all say that he has no rival. Secondly, he is a supreme, he is the supreme being of this universe, which he himself created, by the way. Thirdly, he has the right to our allegiance, priority, and time. Man was not created for himself. Man was created for God. I was not brought into this world for me, even though this is the me generation, and it has been since the 60s, by the way. Matter of fact, I think the me generation has gone back about 6,000 years. The me-itis problem. No, man was created for God. He has the right to our allegiance, priority, and time. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God. Kingdom is the king's domain. The king's dominion. Seek his domain first. And all these things shall be added unto you. Don't worry about yourself. Several years ago, I was very, very, uh, I hit a low spot in my life. I've had one of two of those in my life. And some of you are nodding, I think. You, you kind of know what that means. And I was just walking around uh, the, the kitchen table, and I had the me-itis. Oh, woe is me. Well, woe was me. <laughs> it wasn't faring too well. And on the kitchen table, I happened to glance over there, and there was a piece of sheet music over there. I don't know what it was doing there. 
But I saw this piece of music. I think it was the only one, perhaps. And the title of that particular sheet music was, God Will Take Care of You. Don't worry about you. You be concerned to have your allegiance, priority, and time devoted to the God of the Bible. Fourthly, he is authority. Authority has to do with this. The right to say so and the power to enforce. Uh, let me give you an illustration that I've used many, many a time, but I think most of you will be able to identify with this illustration. you got a car, a brand new car. I don't know what you got. It might be a muscle car, for all I know. One of those... Uh, you know, Plymouth Roadrunners or something like that. Who knows what you got? But you got to try the thing out. And you ride on that turnpike. Try not to use the Pennsylvania turnpike. Use something else. I've been on that thing for 50 years, and every year they're working on it, and they can't seem to get it done. That's called your tax dollars at work. <laughs> Anyway, you're out there and you think, man, I got this muscle job. I'm going to try it out. So you're on that straight and narrow. You're really moving. I mean, you're cruising. And you got it up to 70 and think, man, this is a muscle car. So I know it'll do 80 or 90. And so you're, you know, you found the accelerator. Finally, you found the accelerator. You were just coasting. Now you're going 90 or 100. And suddenly in the back you see this. This cherry on top. Hey, I've seen a couple of those. I got clobbered by a couple. I, I shouldn't put this on tape because you know what? It's discriminating against myself. But anyway, this guy is, he's moving along. And this guy behind him can't catch up with him because he's going 130 now, see? But up front he sees something very odd. A bunch of cars sitting sideways like this in the middle of the road. And they all have cherries on top. And he decides, well, boy, I better do something about that. I got this brand new uh, muscle car over here, and I, I don't want to, you know, get any dents on the thing. So he stops. And uh, this officer, two, three, four, five of them keep walking towards him, and he decides, oh, boy, this is not good. Okay, authority is the right to say so, and that is represented by the 65-mile speed limit sign. The right to say so. Somebody had the right to put up that sign saying 65. Matter of fact, half the turnpike is 40 now. Well, not quite half. <laughs> Might as well have taken the side road at that speed. But the right to say so, that's that sign. But also the power to enforce, the power to enforce is the cherry on top, the man with the uniform. He has the power to enforce that 65-mile sign. Matter of fact, some of us go 70, 72, and we, we got the five-mile leeway. Technically, they can get you for that because you're more than the 65 what do we mean that God has authority? He is authoritative. He is the authority. Well, it's right here in the definition. First of all, he has the right to say so. This is his universe, not ours. He has the right to say so and the power to enforce what he said. And he will do so. That's his word. See, Who is God? Well, you're beginning to get a picture of a multiple definition of who God is. And in my vocabulary, it's the God of the Bible to whom I'm referring. And only to him. Because he has no rival, remember? Right. Now we come to capital letter E. He is to be the supreme value in our lives. Please turn to Philippians, the book of Philippians. What do we mean by supreme value? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those are known as the prison epistles. Chapter 3, 
verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. What is it that's valuable to you in your life? Think about it. I, I can't answer that question for you. I don't know. What, what is it that's valuable to you? I probably watch only one TV program a week on the average. I usually won't watch more than that. Monday night. It's not football because they took it off. And I don't even know if Pittsburgh won or lost today. So it's not football. But I watch something that's of interest to me. It's called the Antique Roadshow. Some of these, one of these days they're going to auction me off on that thing. I'll be very antique. But that's fascinating because it shows you what people think is valuable. Really. Man, Pastor, I saw a book on there for sale the other day. It went for thousands of dollars for one book. And then it's interesting. This guy spent $3,000 on this vase, a vase. If you're really cultured, you say vase. You know, you know, don't, don't use the word vase. For me, it's a vase. For you, it's a vase. 3000 bucks. Brought it to the Antique Roadshow. Uh, you know, I hate to tell you this, but that's a reproduction. Give you five bucks for it. Make it six. Where are people's values? What's your value system? You're going to lose it all anyway down here. When I, listen, when, I, when the rapture takes place and the Lord takes me home, one of, whichever comes first, I'm leaving my books down here. That's, that's going to be tragic, but I'm going to leave them down here because I won't need them up there. I probably have a far better library up there. I have the greatest teacher up there. The greatest teacher. My value system is not contingent on the things of this earth. Because we don't get to keep it. Somebody has once said he has never seen a hearse followed by a U-Haul. <laughs> you ain't taking it with you, folks. And that's not good English grammar either. Capital letter F. How do I define God? God is the object of worship. If you want to do a study of worship, go to the book of Revelation. I mean, you've got all the Psalms. You've got other passages of Scripture loaded. But I, I think for me, the, Psalm, the, the book of Revelation kind of gives me insight and we don't have the time to do this tonight, but just let me touch upon it briefly, if I may. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the last book in your Bible, Revelation chapter 4. And notice carefully, verse 11, I believe. You are worthy, O Lord. Pastor, I think you sing that chorus. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. A great chorus. To receive glory and honor and power. I think that's where this is taken from, from this verse. For you created all things. By your will they exist and were created. He is the object of worship, chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Do you know the word worship is an interesting word? Because it comes to us from the old English language, way back in time. And originally the word worship had a TH in it. It was worth ship w o r t h and then the ship on the end worth ship that's where that word came from so when you are worshiping god in essence 
you are ascribing worthiness to him. That's what you're doing. And I went through the worship passages in Revelation. Power and might belong to him 12 times. Eternality, he is eternal, seven times. His glory, five times. His honor, five times is mentioned. Justice, righteousness, truth, five times. Holiness, four times. Blessing, three times. All of these are attributing worthiness, worship, to God. God is somebody who is to be worshipped. And finally, under this particular section, he is the ultimate ruler and judge. And folks, that is scary. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Lord of your life, this is a scary proposition. Uh, would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 20? This is the great white throne judgment. And I was really frustrated because I was saying, should I do this tonight? Should I do the great white throne judgment tonight? Should I do prophecy tonight? So finally we're doing this, Pastor. And, 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 and that's <laughs> All of God's word is God-breathed and worthy to be studied. But this is the great white throne judgment. And by the way, Pastor and I are sipping coffee a few weeks ago. Uh, we're sipping coffee and we're talking about this. And uh, we were hashing over about whether born-again believers are going to be there at the great white throne. Not to be judged, not to, but to participate with Jesus in the judgment. And I believe we are. And this is where all the lost of all history, human history, are going to be gathered. The books are going to be open, and God says, uh, you're not in my book. Or he says, your works don't show that you're worthy of Christ. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And there shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. This is the great white throne judgment. I saw a great white throne, verse 11, and him who sat on it. Notice what happens. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. May I, may I put it in proper English? There was no more place to hide, and there was no more place to escape. No more making excuses. No more. Now you are before the God of this universe, before the God of the Bible. And now there's no more leaving. Now it's a done deal. It's final. I think uh, Revelation 20 should be one of the strongest motivators for Christians to tell their family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, should be one of the strongest motivators to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ and that they need to be born again. You must be born again. Well, this is sort of what defines God for me by definition. Uh, we haven't even dealt with his attributes or traits tonight or characteristics or nature. I'm simply saying, if somebody should ask me, what do you mean by God? I'm saying this is what I think of when you talk about God. But here are those who deny God. And I don't want to go into detail tonight because our time is running short, but let's look at it briefly, okay? And then I want to finish with one passage of Scripture. God deniers divert from the true worship of God. Remember the golden calf? That was a denial, that was a deviation from the true God. Make for us a golden calf. Oh, it just so happened it came out of the fire that way. Amazing what the fire can do. I used to work with polyurethane. You put it in a mold, you stick it in a press, you take it out. Presto, there it is. Well, this diverts from the real thing, doesn't it? 
Secondly, when God is denied, it's incapable of acting in behalf of the worshiper. Whatever is being worshipped as God is incapable of acting in behalf of the worshiper. Remember Elijah? Hey, you, you guys, you, you got to scream out louder. Get, the, your God over here, is, is, he's taking a nap. He's sleeping. You got to do something to wake the guy up. And there's a song to that too, the God of Elijah, right? The God of Elijah. Guess what? Elijah had buckets poured around the altar and then fire came from God and consumed the Hey, that's the real God. Yeah, that's the real God. Gods, small g, plural, are incapable of acting in behalf of the worshiper. You can pray all day to these gods. They're not going to do a stitch for you. You, you can take a, a, a statue of some kind and topple it over and nothing's going to happen to you except from other human beings who think that uh, there's something to that statue. It's just a piece of stone, a slab of stone is all it is, or made out of gold or made out of something. Thirdly, gods promote the occult, paganism, and violence. There were people in Psalm 106 who were sacrificing their children to demons. Right. They promote the occult, paganism, and violence. Folks, there's only one supreme being, and his name is the God of the Bible. There is no other. You're wasting your time, you're getting yourself in trouble if you worship anybody else or anything else. Capital letter D, these are short-lived compared to the eternal God. Hey, I don't know what your idol is. I, I'm not picking on anybody tonight, and I'm not being hypocritical. i got two televisions in my house. But some people have the television as their idol, right? As their God, right? Some people have money as their God, right? Hey, folks, you know what? These are short-lived. They're not around forever. Isaiah 41. Then, capital letter E, they're man-made. Imaginary, either from man's imagination or materially. Isaiah says, you, you guys take these, you take, take these wood blocks, you carve out for yourself idols. They're dumb idols. Literally dumb. They're not going to talk to you. They're not going to act in your behalf. They're not going to say, they're not going to help you. You made them. Actually, the dummy is you. Capital letter F, they're unfulfilling. They leave one unsatisfied. You come over and over and do the same ritual over and over again. Worship the same God over and over again. And you go home empty. Because ritual doesn't save you. Relationship to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, alone saves you. And finally, these gods are impersonal. There's no relationship. None. Zero. If you want to, you can go and hug an idol if you want to. Much good that'll do you. Nothing. I'd like to conclude with turning to Joshua, chapter 24. The fifth book in, sixth book in your Bible, Joshua 24. Would you please turn there in your Bibles with me? This is the end of Joshua's life. It's his farewell speech, if you please. He had been with Moses on the mount. He has been true to the Lord. When the spies came back, ten of them belly ached. Can't do it. Never been done before. Sounds like modern day churches. Can't do it. Can't do it. Never been done before. Yeah, you can do it. Hey, if you if you got the Lord and he, he's leading you directly to do something for his glory, you can do it. Two spies said, hey, let's go get him. Joshua was one of them. And who was the other? Caleb. And all the generation that were 20 and younger, 
went into the promised land. Matter of fact, Moses himself didn't go in. He was there later, by the way, Mount of Transfiguration. Moses was there, and Elijah was there. Matthew 17. Okay, so this is his farewell speech to his people. He was a great leader, a wonderful leader, a military man of might. I like Joshua. The guy gives you impetus. He gives you, he, he gives you these goosebumps. You know, that, here comes Ronald Reagan type guy. You know what I mean? Perhaps I shouldn't have used that. <laughs> Come to verse fifteen. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods, small g, plural which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the one and only. Tonight I, I try to do just a little definition of the word God or Lord. I'm trying to define it, what it is and what it isn't. Basically that's what we did tonight. We have a choice to make. I know some of you well enough to say you've made the right choice. You've chosen to dedicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God bless you for that. And someday you'll reap your rewards. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I think it's coming. I agree with Pastor 195%. I think it's sooner rather than later. It's right around the corner. Some of you I don't know well enough. I don't know if you've had to wrestle with this issue. But who is God in your life? Is it a capital G or is it a small g? Is it singular or is it plural? Joshua said, and I know Pastor would say this, and some others of you here would say this, and I will say this, as for me and my house, you shouldn't have any doubts. We are serving the Lord. And some of you do. But if you're here tonight without Christ, let's all bow our heads for just a moment. I know Pastor's going to lead in prayer soon. But just